Yeah, we are different heights. <laughs> I noticed that. I'm a person of normal height. <laughs> right. So good evening. At, I believe it was one of our last conference organizing conference calls, the question of this evening came up. Michael said, who could we get to introduce Sonia Sanchez? I was grateful we weren't Skyping because I was sitting in my office going, <laughs> um, I am so very honored to introduce to you tonight Sonia Sanchez, poet, playwright, activist, transformational force. Longer ago than I would care to admit, while I was a graduate student, I picked up a copy of Homegirls and Hand Grenades. It was the first encounter with her poetry. Emily Dickinson always says that she knew that she was in the, in the presence of a poet when she felt as if the top of her head would explode. I, there was a way in which I thought my whole body was going to explode. The volume was a revelation. I could hear voices, I could hear my experience, I could hear my great-grandmother and my grandmother and my mother and my aunt Dorothy sitting around my grandmother's kitchen table talking about life in close-spent Kentucky and the coal mines and their experiences there. I heard the voice of ancestors and I heard the voice of people like me and I fell in love with poetry. Sixteen years ago, I was fortunate enough to meet Sonia Sanchez in person. This was after my collection had expanded to include I've Been a Woman, Under a Soprano Sky, Wounded in the House of a Friend, Does Your House Have Lions, and Like Singing Coming Off of the Drums. This was a particularly special and memorable event for me, not simply because Sonia was there reading, but my daughter, Micah, who was then about seven years old, came with me. She sat in my lap. She drank in the poetry. She finally fell asleep, but she whispered in my ear, Mama, I'm not sure I understand all the words, but I love the sound of that poetry. She's all grown up now and is herself a poet. So I am eternally grateful to you, Sandra, for giving me back poetry when my undergraduate English professors had nearly ruined it for me, and for planting the seed in my beautiful daughter of language and image, music and voice. You transformed her life. You've transformed my life. I am forever grateful. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Matt Meyer, who has just written um, an equally transformative book, although in a slightly different genre, White Lives Matter Most and Other Little White Lies. Sonia, a woman of all parts, has written the foreword to um, this slim volume, and it's my understanding that she will be available to sign after the lecture. I was asked to say a couple of words connecting um, the theme of the conference to tonight's plenary. And I think I might be a little crazy, but I decided to do it in some kind of poetic prose. Be gentle. The revolution will not be on the course syllabus. Are you ready for the revolution? Seriously ready. Do you have a go bag in case we must move quickly? 
Have you been trained in all the ways we expect to need training? A revolution, Mao said, is not a dinner party, nor is it a well-loved and often taught graduate course, a finely researched, peer-reviewed paper, a candlelight vigil ending in a circle holding hands singing Kumbaya. A revolution, I would guess, can be supported by all these things, sustained and built bit by bit by vigils and research papers and holding hands, by graduate courses, undergraduate courses, high school and middle school and early childhood courses, universal pre-K and 3K and child care and support from working mothers, candles and singing in circles. Revolution, I would guess, can be furthered at times by dinner parties. But a revolution is not, definitionally speaking, a dinner party. Kwame Ture liked to end and begin his comments asking, proclaiming, challenging, ready for the revolution? Fifty years ago, Kwame Ture was Stokely Carmichael, and his popularized outcry, Black Power, was sweeping the world. Fifty years ago, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had already been renamed the Student National Coordinating Committee, and H. Rap Brown, now Jamil Al Amin, and still in prison and gagged for being too black, too strong, famously proclaimed that violence was as American as cherry pie. Whose violence is it anyway? Bayard Rustin said he wanted to make nonviolence as revolutionary as possible. And Rustin, the master tactician, strategist, and organizer, led nonviolence campaigns that exceeded all expectations. Marches on Washington with dreams in the making. School boycotts which shut down entire urban centers. Campaigns against torturous chain gangs which changed the nature of criminal justice and imprisonment in parts of the U.S. South. But Pan-Africanist Bill Sutherland, a friend of Rustin's, said he wanted to make the revolution needed to bring about true justice and lasting peace as nonviolent as possible. And Bill refused to choose between his ethical pacifist principles and his revolutionary friends who chose other paths. Bill joined with the armed guerrillas of Mozambique's Liberation Front, Fridimo, conspired with the freedom fighters of Namibia's Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, and provided steadfast solidarity for both the ANC and PAC and all those who fought for an end to the racist apartheid regime of South Africa. Bill taught that the violence used for self-defense or social change by oppressed people was minuscule compared to the massive violence of the status quo including the violence of poverty and hunger and imperialism. Whose violence, after all, was it anyway? Bill Sutherland was ready for the revolution. Poet Grace Paley called herself a combative pacifist. And feminist Barbara Deming, writing an open letter to Franz Fanon, described nonviolence as an experiment which had only just begun suggesting that truly revolutionary revolutions, that social change looking to last the long haul and get to the real roots of oppression and liberation must somehow have an equilibrium to it, a balance between form and content, means and ends, nightmares, dreams, and desires, our visions and our realities. Sonia Sanchez reminds us that we need to know about homegirls and hand grenades, but also know that peace is a haiku song. Beautiful, challenging, visionary, strategic, sisterly Sonia Sanchez. Now a new generation cites Asada Shakur's assertion, we have a duty to win. Asada Shakur was ready for the revolution, now works for an end to conflict from exile in Cuba. Sonia Sanchez remains ready for the revolution from her Philadelphia home, 
where searching for sisterly and brotherly love is not as easy as it used to be. What do we know of violence in the ivory towers of the global north, far from the forefront of struggles, contemporary and historic? Do we even know the best questions to ask? Who is being violent when the Palestinian child throws a rock back at an Israeli armored tank plowing down her grandmother's olive tree? Who is being violent when the North American academic asks where he can find a Palestinian Gandhi to lead the movement? Who is being violent when the walls go up to form an ever encroaching border? A border not meant to contain, but to constrain, to squeeze, to eradicate, to erase, to ethnically cleanse. Who is being violent when we use the word cleanse rather than exterminate? Whose violence is it anyway? Yet Amokar Cabral said we must become militants, but never militarists. And long before becoming Mrs. Nelson Mandela, long after she was a young educator with Frilimo, Grassa Machel served as the world's leading voice for an end to forced youth, military conscription, and child soldiering. Michel typified Mozambique's lessons learned about the problems of militarism and positive change. Whose nonviolence is it? Who defines us? We are called to become 21st century Maroons, renegades of civilization as usual. We are called to become magic, queer and post-identity, pan everything. We must become ready for revolution. Without readiness, how can we expect success? We must become ready for revolution. Get ready, get set. And now there's nothing else to say but beautiful, challenging, visionary, strategic sister Sonia Sanchez. I was wondering if I could see over this. Uh, can you hear me? I didn't hear it uh, well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, always in a room where people are trying to talk about change talk about answering the question, what does it mean to be human? Because if we don't answer that question in the 21st century, we're not going to have a 22nd century. And if I were some of the young people here, I would be very uptight with people who've come before, because we've given you a, a terrible, 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 terrible place right now. Not necessarily us, but certainly some people have given us a very hard time. It's a hard time for you as young people. And so I apologize if I contributed to any of that that you now have to face. But it is a joy to see you young people out in the world trying to affect change. Um, I had two talks, but I all day today had um, the other talk is, is, is very hard. Uh, it's a hard speech for me to con really reading, to concentrate. Vertigo makes you disconnect, you know? Um, I was in a tornado two years ago. It was actually a twin tornado, if you're ready for that. And I have twins, so it was like in a place called Alabama. Um, and we were down in basement for four and a half hours. And when we came up, it was still storming. Uh, <coughs> And I had gotten a headache and I had the ring of the ears. In fact, the next day when I opened the conference, I said, you know, I have ringing in the ears, so if I start singing, don't say anything. I'm trying to keep beat with the ringing in my ears. 
And I thought that was awfully funny, except that happened for one month. Um, um, and then it went away. And then I said to someone, whoo, imagine that, you know, uh, ringing in the ears and, and um, a headache. Um, and three months later, I was turning a corner and I kept going down, which is an interesting thing with vertigo. It's always something going with the right side, right? Um, so sometimes when I've, we've had bad weather, um, you know, I get all messed up with that thing called vertigo. So forgive me if at some point you hear a little disconnection. Um, I haven't been drinking. I don't drink. <laughs> but it is what I call Ms. Vertigo. I'm writing her a long letter. I've told her that Hitchcock did a movie about her. And so she could, she, why is she hanging out with me? You know what I mean? She's very famous, right? Um, but she persists. I just wanted to, usually I'd start out with clicking and um, calling names, but I um, can't do that uh, tonight. But I did want to say something that Breck said that I always, always usually end with, but I want to begin with. As Bertolt Breck asked of poems, he was adjudicating, what use is it? Are you there to persuade, seduce, instruct with tenderness or brutality, make us think, help us to arm ourselves against fascism? Are your poems a communication act? Do they search you out of complacency, begin a dialogue? And I always begin my classes with that quote because you see at some particular point, uh, that's what this thing poetry is about, is it not? Uh, it is not, oh, in a very real sense, to keep you, keep you complete, com completely um, contented. And certainly if you read me, you know my poems don't keep you contented. When I started to write, I wanted to tell how I had become, became this woman with razor blades between her teeth. What made me want to pile others into my bloodstream? What made me rise up to tell my story and finally to learn and tell all of our stories? I guess it must have been something underneath our skirts, women, sisters from Africa, the Caribbean, America, Asia, Latin America, South America, the Middle East, Europe, something unaccented, accented in our talk, our walk, sisters. <coughs> I first started to write after my grandmother died. When I was six years old, I child stutterer, who ran with the boys, tasted the wind in my eyes and mouth, and swallowed it whole, I wrote privately and secretly for years. This private self became the public self when I discovered all of the pain and rage inside me had a history and herstory. All of the silence had been superimposed on me. I wrote out loud because I had discovered Du Bois' double consciousness. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, her two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideas, ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And I wrote, come into black geography, you seated like Manzu's cardinal. Come up through tongues multiplying memories and to avoid descent among moons cruising like ships, climb into these sockets golden with brine. Because I was born musician to two black brace, I cut a blue song for America. And you cushioned by middle class springs or ghettos that stretch forces into dust turn corners where people walked on their faces. I sang unbending songs and gathered gods convenient as Christ. I am the frozen face. Here my face marches towards new mists while spring runs green with ghosts. I am the living mask. Here my skin warm with adolescence pierced like Picasso's planes and the earth in one fold of permanence stares at the skies. If 
I had a big piece of dust to ride on, I would gather up my pulse and follow disposable dreams and all things being equal, they would pass into butterflies and quiver in sprawling yellow. Let me pull this chair up. I was involved with a little space up here. Got it. Oh, okay. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Some people called it Birmingham for years, where many of the black women were housewives, mothers, and teachers, workers, and servants. The men were mostly workers. A few well-trained, conditioned ones were teachers in black schools. A few owned businesses in Alabama, and there were a few millionaires. Or some worked in companies like my grandfather, who worked at the American Cast Iron Pipe Company. As pipes came out, he tagged them with a number. And my grandmother was a domestic, housewife, mother, deaconess in the AME Zion Church. We lived within the shadow of segregation, overt racism, in the shadow of black folk at the mercy of everyone, schools, police courts, law, federal, state, local governments, and all of our experiences were shaped by these various forces. I bring to you this short autobiographical statement because I believe the Caribbean writer George Lyman's definition of culture is quite comprehensive and clear when he says, and I quote, Culture is the means whereby people feed themselves and the ways in which they experience their existence ellipsis. A dominant class exclusively white laid a foundation of a cultural force that would influence all our lives. It was the ideology of racism, a morality whose guiding light was the aristocracy of the skin. Black, a commodity for cheap labor, white was the symbol and source of authority, end of quote. In this South of my grandmother and grandfather, father and mother, stood a legalized, institutionalized oppression that spoke to the imposed limitations of black folk, separate schools, sitting at the back of the bus, separate churches, separate burial grounds, separate restaurants, separate faces, divided eyes, viewing ourselves and the world, and fear was a constant companion for black folk, even if you were a privileged black like my father, because he was a teacher, musician, nightclub owner, because a competent, relevant education was unavailable to most poor blacks and working class, just as today, for most poor and working class people. If you had an education, you were a privileged black, and that made for real social stratification. One of my missions then as a writer educator has been to eradicate, erase the aura of the educated class while cherishing the creative power of learning, a task for the truly creative teacher, writer, preacher, worker, lawyer, judge, mother, father, bus driver, human being. One of my missions has been to celebrate the nodding men and women, the red, black, gums, corn cops, smoking, church going, sisters, staring people who were never considered poetic or human, but we gave them life and form and beauty and made them human. I want to read a piece called Dear Mama. Okay. I was a, uh, let me preface this piece. I was a terrible little girl uh, growing up. The problem is that I had a sister who was beautiful. It is terrible to have a sister who is beautiful. Even to the this, and even before my sister died and she'd gotten older, you know, she'd come to my father's house and I'd be there, you know, with my father. And the older men would be sitting there. And the moment she came in, they said, oh, Miss Patricia, Miss Patricia. And they'd get up and make sure she had the right seat and whatever she wanted to eat, whatever. You know, I would come in and say, oh, uh, Miss Sonia, hi. And then they continued on with my sister Pat, right? Um, so it is terrible. And, and I would go out and play. My grandmother would send us out to play. And I went out and played. You know, I got dirty. The dresses got torn. You know, my hair, the braids were out. And my sister came back in daintily dainty. You know, you know she and the other girls had not done anything except stand and be pretty, whatever. And my aunts... My aunts would say out loud, um, um, uh, they look at me and, and so, tis, 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 girl, you just aren't going to grow up to be a lady. And I said, that, that could have an advantage uh, for me. Um, but mama, 
And then the, then my, the cousins would get, my aunties would get very angry at me because I just looked at them and say something under my breath. And my aunt and my grandmother would say, just let the girl be, she'd be all right. And I'm forever grateful for her, um, for, for standing up for me because they kept saying she needs to be more like Pat. Um, and uh, that is something to live with uh, all your life, um, to be just like your sister, uh, beautiful, especially when you knew that you were not as beautiful as your sister, far from it. And she was indeed uh, a raving beauty. Um, uh, but you know, well, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm just saying at that time, you know, whatever. I mean, I know, you know, I know what it means uh, at some point, because when I got older, of course, I smiled at it, you know, because I, I knew who I was. But as a little girl, but I'm saying Mama was the one who simply uh, kept me on the right track and who hugged me and said, like, you know, come here, my pretty little girl. Right. There's nothing like grandmothers, if you understand uh, what I'm saying. And I thought I knew that poem was in that book, right? Isn't it amazing? You have to forgive me, but I think I know my books, but you do 20 books, and you, you really don't know. You really don't know your books, you know what I mean? I'm going to have to look in the, as my children say to me, they're so smart, you know, why don't you look in the contents, Mom? <laughs> and I kind of give them a funny look, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in from... A, under soprano sky, um, and and that is that is. Um, I hope I brought it. Would you mind handing me my briefcase? This is really really weird. Isn't that something? That that's what I mean about this. Something that I would know automatically. Um, Miss Vertigo, is there a book in there? Thank you. So that's, so I won't read Mama. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? No, here it is. It is. I got it. Page 63. You know, I knew that it was in this book. Got it. So sorry. Whew. Dear Mama, it is Christmas Eve and the year is passing away with callous feet. My father, your son, and I decorate the night with words, sit ceremoniously in human song, watch our blue sapphire words eclipse the night. We have come to this simplicity from afar. He stirs, pulls from his pocket a faded picture of you, black woman, sitting in frigid peace, all of your biography preserved in your face, and my eyes draw up short as he says her name was Elizabeth, but we used to call her Lizzie. And I hold your picture in my hands, but I know your name by heart. It's Mama. I hold you in my hands and let time pass over my face. Let my baby be. She ain't like the others. She rough. She'll stumble on gentleness later on. Ah, oh, Mama. Gentleness ain't never been no stranger to my genes, but I did like the roughness of running and swallowing the wind, diving in rivers I could bear swim, jumping from second story windows into a saving backyard bush. I did love you for loving me so hard until I slid inside your veins and sailed your blood to an uncrucified shore. And I remember Saturday afternoons at our house, the old sister Deaconesses sitting in sacred pain, black cadavers, burning with lost aromas, and I crawled behind the couch and listened to breaths I had never breathed, tasted their enormous martyrdom, lives spent on so many things, heard their laughter as Sister Smith's latest performance in church, her purse selling towards Brother Thomas's head again. And I hugged the laughter round my knees, draped it round my shoulders like a Spanish shawl. And history began once again. I received it and let it circulate in my blood. I learned on those Saturday afternoons about women rooted in themselves, raising themselves in dark America, discharging their pain without ever stopping. I learned about women fighting men back when they hit them. Don't never let no men's hit you more than once, girl. I learned about women waking up their men's in the night with pans of hot grease and the compromises reached after the smell of hot grease that penetrated their sleepy brains. 
I learned about loose women walking their abandoned walk down front in church, crossing their legs instead of their hands to God, and I crept into my eyes, along with my daydreams of being woman, adult, powerful, loving like them, allowing nobody to rule me if I didn't want to be. And when they left... When those old bodies had gathered up their sovereign smells after they had kissed and packed up beans snapped and cakes cooked and laughed a bag, after they had called out their last goodbyes, I crawled out of my place, surveyed the room, then walked over to the couch where some had sat for hours and bent my head and smelled their evening smells. I screamed out loud, ooh, we ain't that stinky. And I laughed laughter from a thousand corridors, and you turned, Mama, closed the door, chased me round the room until I crawled into a corner where your large body could not reach me. But your laughter pierced a little alcove where I sat laughing at the night, and your humming sprinkled my small space, your humming about your Jesus and how one day he was going to take you home. Because you died when I was six, Mama, I never laughed like that again. Because you died without warning, Mama, my sister and I moved from family to stepmother to friend of the family. I never felt your warmth again. But I knew corners and alcoves and closets where I was pushed when some mad woman went out of control, where I sat for days while some woman raved in rhymes about unwanted children and work and not enough money or love. And I set out my childhood with stutters and poems gathered in my head like some winter storm and the poems erased the stutters and pain and the words love me and I love them in return my first real poem was about you mama and death my first real poem recited an alphabet of spit splattering a white bus driver's face after he tried to push cousin Lucille off a bus and she left Birmingham under the cover of darkness forever my first real poem is about your child's white arms holding me up against death. My life flows from you, Mama. My style comes from a long line of Louises who picked me up in the night to keep me from wetting the bed. A long line of Sarahs who fed me and my sister and 14 other children from watery soups and beans and a lot of imagination. A long line of Lizzies who made me understand love, sharing, holding a child up to the stars, holding your tribe in a grip of love. A long line of black people holding each other up against silence. I still hear your humming, Mama. The color of your song calls me home. The color of your words saying, let her be. She got a right to be different. She gonna stumble on herself one of these days. Just let the child be, and I be, Mama. In North, where my family moved, To the north of New York City, the north of Harlem, East Harlem, tenements, brownstones, bodegas, and barrios, the north of a first floor back apartment, the north of a bedroom with a window face and a brick wall and a courtyard of garbage and smells and sounds of poor people's voices splitting the night. In the north of subtle racism, an open disrespect of a teacher walking into our classroom and stating to the boys, I don't know why I'm going to try to teach you anything because you'll just end up in jail. And some of the young men fulfilled her prediction and ended up in prison. And she turned and looked at the young girls and said, I don't know why I'm going to teach you. You're just going to end up having babies. And some of them did. This teacher lived out what Carlos Fuente said. We only hurt others when we're in capable of imagining them. Cruelty is caused by a failure of the imagination, the inability to assign the same feelings and values to another person that you harbor in yourself. So I help people to imagine me, black woman, men, children, and all of our beautiful and terrible selves just like them. Norma. As a teenager, I was very shy. I always felt so conspicuous that I talked with my head down, walked with my head down, and would have slept with my head down if sleeping had demanded a standing position. It was with difficulty that I mustered up courage to ask Mr. Castor again and again, but, 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 but how do you feel? Factor that e 
equation. I, 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 I don't understand how it's done. And he kept pointing to the book and looking upward as if the combination of those actions would give me the immediate joy of an answer. A sound from the back of the class made me turn around. It was the people, the people who sat in the back and talked when they wanted to, ate their lunches when they wanted to, and paid attention when they wanted to. They were paying attention to Mr. Castor and me, and I shook. I always wanted to be inconspicuous around the people. Odessa screamed, sit down, Mr. Castor, you don't know crap. Norma, go up front and teach that little pipsqueak how to do this algebra. As Mr. Castor moved to the sidelines like some dejected player, Norma got up and began her slow walk up to the blackboard. Have you ever seen a river curve back on itself? That was Norma as she walked on the edge of the classroom. She was heavy with white petticoats as she questioned, what you want to know, Sonia? Indeed, what did I want to know? It was all so very simple. I just wanted to know how to factor the problem so I could do my homework, nothing else. I had a father waiting for me at home who would take no excuses concerning homework. He said, the teachers are there. If you don't know, ask them. They know the answers. He didn't know Mr. Castor, though. As I asked the question, she sighed and explained the factoring process in such an easy manner. I wrote it all down and closed my math notebook. I could do my homework now. I would, I, there would be no problem with the family. Norma was still at the blackboard. She hadn't moved, and I knew that she was waiting for Lewis to say something. Lewis was the other brain in the class. They were always discussing some complex math problem. As if on cue, Lewis called out a more difficult question. She smiled. The smile ripened on her mouth like pomegranates. Her fingers danced across the board. I watched her face. I was transfixed by her face that torpedoed the room with brilliance. She pirouetted problem after problem on the blackboard. We all thought genius. Norma is a mathematical genius. I used to smile at Norma, and sometimes she smiled back. She was the only one in the group who spoke to the pipsqueak sitting up front. The other spoke, but it was usually a command of sorts. Norma would sometimes shake off her friends and sit down with the pipsqueaks and talk about the South. She was from Mississippi. She ordained us all with her red clay Mississippi talk. Her voice thawed us out from the merciless cold studying the hallways. Most of the time, though, she laughed only with her teeth. One day, Norma called out a question in our French class. I understood the question. French was my favorite class. Mrs. Lefebvre was startled. She was a hunchback who swallowed her words, so it was always difficult to understand her. But Norma's words were clear. Mrs. Lefebvre spoke her well-digested English. No rudeness, please, Norma. You are being disrespectful. I shall not tolerate this. Norma continued the conversation in French. Her accent was beautiful. I listened while her words fell like mangoes from her lips. The people laughed. Talk that talk, Norma. Go on, girl. Keep on doing it, whatever you're saying. Mayhem. The smell of mayhem stalked the room. I wondered if the people would lock us all in the closet again. Mrs. Afreb screamed, silence, silence, savages. How dare you ask me about my affliction? It is none of your business. As she talked, her large owl head bobbed up and down on her waist. I wondered if she had trouble each night taking off her black dress. Her head was so large. Norma stood up and started to pack her books. The noise subsided. She walked to the door, turned, and said, I just wanted to talk to you in your own language so you wouldn't be so lonely. You always look so lonely up there behind your desk. But screw you, you old bitch. You can go straight to hell for all I care, hunchback and all. She exited 
The others followed, dragging their feet and mumbling black morning words. Mrs. Lefebvre stood still like a lizard gathering the sun. I never liked that class after that. I still got good grades, but Norma, when she came to the French class, just sat and watched us, struggled with our accents in amusement. I wondered what she did after school. I wondered if she ever studied. George Washington High School was difficult. Our teachers had not prepared us for high school. The first year was catch-up time. My sister and I spent long nights in our small room reading and studying our material. I don't remember who it was. It was announced one day at school that Norma was pregnant. She had been dismissed from school. I had almost forgot Norma, the mathematical genius. Norma, the linguist. The year had demanded so much work, and old memories and faces had faded into the background. I was rushing to the library. The library had become my refuge during the summer of 55. As I turned the corner of 145th Street, I heard her hello. Her voice was like stale music in bar rooms. There she stood, Norma, eyelids heavy, woman of four children, with tracks running on her legs and arms. How you be doing, Norma? You're looking good, girl. I'm making it, Sonia. You really do look good, girl. Heard you went on to Hunter College. Glad you made it. You should have gone too, Norma. You were the genius, the linguist. You were the brain. We just studied and got good grades. You were the one who understood it all, and I started to cry on that summer afternoon. I heard a voice from very far away pat me home to a country of incense, to a country of red clay. I heard her laughter, dancing with fireflies. Tongue tied by time and drugs, she smiled a funny smile and introduced me to her girls, four beautiful girls. Norma predicted that they would make it. They wouldn't be like their mother. They would begin with a single step. Then they would jump mountains. I agreed. She agreed. We agreed to meet again. Then I pulled myself up and turned away, never to agree again. My struggle and the struggle of others for identity and liberation has influenced my imagination and the creativity of many writers. For in this supposed free north, I discovered schools that taught signs in black and Latino neighborhoods with no laboratories. I discovered tenements and no regular garbage pickup. I discovered corner store owners who kept books of what you owe, purchased, and dared your father or mother to speak up or disagree or you'd be cut off the loan line, the come to the store and buy for credit line. I discovered bars and liquor stores on our corners and storefront church sounds, breaking the sullen Harlem air with their sounds of swinging jubilee and hope and despair. I discovered a little girl in love with books and writing. And no one cared and no one thought years later, even in Hunter College, that writing was a possibility for someone black and female. As my counselor stated at Hunter College, you want to be a writer, and she laughed. No, there are no Negro writers. You must be realistic. We let you come here to Hunter, you privileged ones, so you can be a social worker or a teacher or a nurse. A writer that's not realistic, and she leaned back and laughed again, and I accepted her analysis of my life and others' analysis of my life, including my father's advice, get an education, girl, it'll help you, free you, then get married and move to Long Island or Mount Vernon, leave Harlem, the Harlem of black, yellow, tan faces, asking for equality, life, love, freedom. I was blessed to have studied with Louise Bogan at NYU, who began to listen to my words with some respect. It was in her class that I published my first poem, a poem to my grandmother. And then I heard the southern thunder, saw the bravery of black students in the south, saw them sitting in, waiting in, questioning others' authority over their lives. And then I heard new words, boycott, freedom now, we shall overcome, freedom riders, Fannie Lou Hamer words, Little Rock, Snick, Martin Luther King words, Montgomery, Alabama, we shall overcome words, SCLC words, Birmingham for little girls massacred, and the church words, Infunda Ella Baker words. And then I joined New York Corps, picketed, closed Woolworth stores, opened up apartment buildings for blacks and Puerto Ricans and women, helped to open the unions in New York City. We in New York Corps threw a massive picket line around Harlem Hospital. My dad, I had my dad living at 135th Street, 
uh, at Lenox Terrace, and Harlem Hospital was right, right across the street from there. And um, we were in the core office at 125th Street Core. New York Core had just moved back to Harlem. Um, and someone called the office and said, they're, going, they're starting to, to build an extension to Harlem Hospital. And we had been trying to open up the, the, the unions, uh, the electrical unions and plumbers unions to, for black and Puerto Rican men in a place called New York City. And we left the office at 125th Street and drove up to 135th Street and threw a massive picket line around and we started to see we would not be moved. My dad tells the story. He lived at 135th on the 17th floor. He went out with his binoculars. He looked down at Harlem Hospital and saw his daughter <laughs> online, but he also turned the binoculars this way and saw the police on horseback coming towards us, and we didn't see them at all. And he dropped his binoculars. He ran um, to the elevator, it was too slow, and he started to, he told me later on, he started to run down the steps. But as luck was ha would have it, but there's no such thing as luck. Um, the first black lieutenant or captain was being driven to work, and we had blocked uh, him get, get going across 135th Street and Lenox Avenue, and he jumped out of his car and said to us, what do you people want? And we said, we want to open up the unions. To, to black and Puerto Ricans. And he said, don't do it outside, take it downtown. And he went inside and got some of the labor people, uh, union people, and we went downtown. And at three o'clock in the morning, from that time until three o'clock in the morning, finally, the, one of the, the union leaders said, so, okay, 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 give us some names. And we were so young, we didn't have any names with us at that time. All the names were in the office. But I gave my brother's name, who was always fixing everything electrical in, in, in that apartment, right? And by the time I got home, the telephone was ringing. I knew it was my father. It's about 3.30 a.m. in the morning. So I lit a cigarette. My children said, you smoke, Mom? I said, yeah. Lit a cigarette put on some coffee, warmed up some coffee from the morning, went to the bathroom. In those days, the telephone would ring forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, really, until you picked it up, right, you know. And I picked it up after about the 20th ring, and I said, yeah, Dad. And he said, Sonia, Sonia, why don't you just get married and have some kids and stop running around? You almost got killed today. Uh, and I won't tell you what I said to my father. I was very rude. Um, and, uh, but I said, Dad, 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 before I get the phone, tell Wilson to go downtown. I said, I got to get the address. Go downtown to the electrical union. I put his name in for the union. You know, he would be a part of that union. And he said, really? He said, a job. I said, what do you think we're out there in the streets for? Yeah, and my brother was the first black in New York City in that electrical union. Um, One of the young men brought into the electrical union was my brother. And I want to read about my brother coming north. This is a book done in Rhyme Royal. Uh, any of those who write know that that's a rough form. And you live with a, a rhyming dictionary. You sleep with a rhyming dictionary. You walk with a rhyming dictionary. You eat with a rhyming dictionary. You spit with a rhyming dictionary also, too. And that form is AA. Uh, you know, A-A-B-B-B-C-C. This is my brother who comes north not to love his family but to cause dissension and to hate, literally hate his family, his northern family. This was a migration unlike the 1900s of black men and women coming north for jobs, freedom, life. This was a migration to begin to bend a father's heart again, to burst seduction from the past, to repay desertion at last. Imagine him short and black, thin mustache straping thin lips. Imagine him country and exact, thin body underfed hips, watching at this corral of battleships and bastards, watching for forget and remember, dancing his pirouette. And he came, my brother, at 17, recruited by birthright and smell, grabbing the city by the root with clean metallic teeth, commandant and infidel, pirating his family in their cell, and we waited for the anger to retreat, and we watched him embrace the city and the street. First, 
He auctioned off his legs, eyes, heart, and rooms of specific pain. He specialized in generalized, learned New York ease and all profane, enslaved his body to cocaine, denied his father's signature, damned his sister's overture. And a new geography greeted him. The Atlantic drifted from offshore to lick his wounds to give him slim transfusion as he turned, changed war, a new waistcoat of solicitor, antidote to his southern skin, ammunition for a young paladin, and the bars, the glitter, the light, discharging pain from his bygone anguish of young black boys scared of the night. Sequestered on this new bank, he surveyed the fish, sweet cargoes, crowded with scales, feverish with quick sails, full sails of flesh, searing the coastline of his acquiesce, and the days rummaging his eyes, and the nights flickering through a slit of narrow bars, hips, thighs, and his thoughts labeling him misfit as he prowled, pranced in the starlit city, coloring his days and nights with gluttony and praise and unreconciled rights. My brother coming north in a green suit, and it wasn't a hip New York green, it was like a country green, right, you know? <laughs> and when I first saw him, I said, if I do nothing else, I will get him out of this green suit, right? And then I heard King, if our economic system is to survive, there has got to be a better distribution of wealth we can't have a system where some people live in superfluous wealth while others live in abject, deadening poverty. From now on, he said, I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to live for and with those who find themselves seeing life as a long and desolate corridor with no exit sign. This is the way I'm going. If it means suffering a bit, I'm going that way. If it means sacrificing, I'm going that way. I'm going that way because I heard a voice saying, do something. He said, there are 40 million poor people here. We must ask the question, why are there are 40 million poor people in America? When you begin to ask that question, you're raising questions about the economic system, about the broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. I am simply saying that more and more, we've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. We are called upon to help the discouraged, discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day, we must come to see that in Edison, which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. You see, my friends, for others. I heard we must recognize that we can't solve our problems now until there's a radical redistribution of economic and political power. Integration must be seen not merely in aesthetic or romantic terms. It must be seen in political terms. Integration in its true dimension is shared power. And then I heard the morning northern thunder Malcolm and his voice sent me out looking for myself into the Schomburgs of the world. And I found Robeson, Du Bois, Delaney's Blake, or the Huts of America. And I was no longer afraid of Malcolm because he was part of a continuum, he and Martin. And I found Chestnut, Wheatley, Gene Toomer, Langston Hughes, Frederick Douglass, Claude McKay, Ida Wells Barnett, Ann Spencer, Garvey, Brown, Sterling, and William Wells, David Walker, Margaret Walker, John Brown, Dudley Randall, Gwendolyn Brooks, Arthur Davis. And Malcolm sent my eyes overseas to Gugawa Thiongo, Fidel, Chinua, Achebe, and Yeri, Chairman Mile, Nkrumah, Lumumba, C. L. James, Gillian, Neruda. Malcolm said, we must expand the civil rights struggle to a higher level, to the level of human rights. Whenever you are in a civil rights struggle, whether you know it or not, you are confining yourself to the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam. When you expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights, you can take the case of black men, women in this country before the nations of the UN, before a world court, but you can do it only at the level of human rights. Civil rights keeps you in his pocket. Civil rights means you're asking Uncle Sam to treat you right. Human rights are something you were born with. And I made an amazing discovery. When you go searching for your identity, when you write about your people and your struggle, when you begin a journey of identity and liberation, you find yourself in others who have been vanished too or who have also hidden their eyes from themselves. And as I helped found black, black studies in San Francisco in the mid-1960s, I found for my two Japanese-American students information about concentration camps, signs asking Japanese people to report at a certain time and date. And they went home and asked their parents about these signs. And and their parents told them an amazing story of concentration 
concentration camps where Japanese Americans were sent because people thought of them not as Americans, not loyal, strange ones, probably only loyal to Japan, though they were American citizens. And as I taught, I found Native Americans. I found the Long March, Wounded Knees, Sitting Bull Geronimo, and every treaty made with Native Americans had been broken. I found Chief Seattle who said, these shores will swarm with the invisible dead of my tribe, be just, and deal kindly with Indian people, for the dead are not powerless. Dead, did we say, there is no death, only a change of worlds. I found Chinese men and women secreted in the creases of America, America, Chinese men building railroads, banging dynamite in mountains, and exploding in western yellows, dying alone, working in the laundry rooms of America, ironing white sheets, shirts with heavy irons, asking my yellow, bang, almond-eyed sister, you Chinese, you Chinese. I found Chicanos portrayed as lazy, sleeping underneath movie sombreros, si senor, si senor, I Get up soon, Patron, and do that work for you. He, 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 he. I just need a little siesta. Si, senor. Si, senor. Me don't work too hard. But Conchita, she do enough work for the two of us. He, he, he. I found concentration camps with Jews and gypsies and others and gays stretch out along a funeral plain, moving in the rain of ash, unraveling minds. I found Puerto Ricans alienated from their homeland. Found some asking for independence in the hallways of Congress. Found them not learning Spanish because their parents wanted them to be good Americans. I met gays and lesbians coming out in the streets of America, taking over San Francisco politics till a so-called strange illness curtailed their actions for a decade. I found Bernard Herring, a Roman Catholic teacher, who said we must stop the materialistic growth mania uh, for more and more production and more and more markets for selling unnecessary and even damaging products. It is a sin against the generations to come. What shall we leave them? Rubbish, atomic weapons, numerous enough to make the world uninhabitable, a poison atmosphere, and polluted water. So to be a black woman, poet, professor, activist, to write and teach about social justice, peace, freedom, sexual justice, economic justice, peace, peace, peace. To teach your students not to compete, but to compete in this process called learning together. To have group exams where students learn how to study together, help each other, and learn not to compete. To take your students outside the university into public schools, neighborhoods, into the Schomburgs, of, into high schools, community centers, into prisons to teach and learn. When you take your writing classes outside in the fall and spring to listen to the leaves and flowers and grass turning over in beauty and conversation. I began to teach and originate new words for the classroom, diarchy, not a matriarchal and patriarchal system for black folks. Many involved in a diarchy, two people in the house, grandmothers and mothers, two aunts and a child, mother, uncle and children, a family system functioning under duress. I had to understand Douglas's statement, I thank God for making me a man, and Mondelani, 1859, I thank God for making me a black man. To teach or explain the new double consciousness we read in Vincent Harding's There is a River, and the tension of an African identity and a struggle for freedom at home, immigration and struggle at home, to see in Melville's Benito Sereno that Barbo and Captain Delano are the national double consciousness, and in the modern day society, we see the secondary consciousness I coined in the late 1960s, the emergence of black women who develop a secondary consciousness about family and self, and we see it all the way to Toni Morrison's, um, um, oh, Sonia, um, The Bluest Eye, when black women began to look at themselves secondarily through the eyes of white women. Isn't that amazing? You know, that's America. America taught us that. That is amazing, amazing, horrific thing in this place called America. Um, um, um. This will lead you on a journey to the discovery of self where you find others hiding out also. And you extend your hand tentatively and say, you must be the brother. You must be the sister they never told me about. Hola, bonjour, ni hao, ni hao. Salam alaikum, shalom, hotep, namaste, buenos dias, abaragani. Hey, how, how you be? What's up, what's happening? Walking upright in the 21st century towards the light that was, is Brother Martin, Brother Malcolm, Brother Megger, Brother Nkrumah, Brother Mandela, Brother Howard Zinn, Brother John Brown, Brother Haki, Brother Baraka, Brother Paul Robeson, Brother Karinga, 
Sister Rosa Parks, Sister Fannie Lou Hamer, Sister Ella Baker, Brother James Baldwin, Brother Paul Robeson, Sister Winnie Mandela, Sister Audrey Lord, Sister June Jordan, Sister Kay Boyle, Sister Audrey Rich, Sister Yuri Ko Kochiyama, Sister Tony Morrison, Sister Bernice Reagan, Sister Alice Walker, Brother John Henry Clark, Dorothy Height, Margaret Walker, Warriors, Rainbow Warriors, Walking, Teaching Social and Sexual Justice, Peace, Making it better for us all. eBay, 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 ye, 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 you too long <laughs> and I cut uh, I know you kept see me full I, I cut um, uh, some of the things that I had written um, and some of the poems that I wanted to read that would complement some of the things but it's late you know and I know how hard it is me at a conference okay people for someone to go beyond 35 minutes so anyway maybe another time but I will sign books uh -huh. Thank you, my dear sister.